Welcome everybody to the UCSF Division of Geriatrics Grand Rounds. I'm very honored to introduce our speaker today, Miguel Tenyagua. Uh, a little bit about Miguel. Uh, let's make sure I get this right. Miguel did his intro medicine training at the University of Illinois. And then no. Yes, medical, medical. Sorry, internal medicine at UW, and Jerry fell in with Michi at UW. From there, went to the University of Florida, where um, he was faculty there. University of my, I got him getting this down. Uh, uh, St. Louis University, where Daphne Lowe, one of our previous fellows and faculty members. We all pushed her to do geriatric medicine, so we're very honored now that Miguel is also a uh, division or section chief at uh, SLU and um, uh, what was the other program director of internal medicine. Wait, were you Daphne's? I am program director. No, no, uh, M Star Facts. Oh, M Star Facts. Uh, mm -hmm. Then moved to Philly because I. I heard you at the Mother Museum, so if anybody needs tours of the Mother Museum, there's a lot here. Uh, where uh, he joined the National Board of Veterans Sanders there for eight years, and now is Vice President for Medical Education at ACP. Miguel hasn't talked to you about joining ACP. Join ACP. I just joined yesterday. Thanks, Miguel. Great to meet you. And with that, I will turn it over to Miguel. Thanks for that introduction. Um, <laughs> maybe after we do my disclosure slide, uh, 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 commercial interest. I was really nervous about doing this talk because uh, I've always been enamored with UCSF and, and the faculty and the fellows, and um, I was not disappointed today getting to meet everybody. It's been such an absolute, absolute joy. Um, but I also remember what my one of my mentors, Phil Hazard, used to say about geriatricians. He said, geriatricians, we are the golden retrievers of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> and so I felt immediately less nervous. So I'm talking to my, my, fellow, my fellow geriatricians. So, so well, um, Eric screwed this up. I, I knew I meant to all the things I knew with ACP, but I will be talking about um, some things we're doing mostly in research and development related to um, uh, ACP. I'm getting a note that the audio might be a little pixelated, if that makes any sense, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try not to move around too much. Um, so other than that, I have nothing to disclose in regards to uh, ACCMA. One thing I did today, sort of informally with the fellows and with the faculty, that I've done when I've done versions of, of parts of this talk around the country is do a bit of a needs assessment and I ask three questions. One is, is talking about the challenges you have with incorporating board prep uh, for either your initial or your specialty certification in your curriculum. Um, the answers I got today were pretty consistent with what you see in this word cloud. A lot of it is just T-I-M-B, having time to do it. Um, certainly, level of learner comes into play as a, a close second, and, and having the faculty to actually uh, deliver the material is a big one. Predominant method you use right now, uh, what I heard from the fellows was questions, 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 uh, which makes a lot of sense. If you're going to learn how to ride a bike, you don't read a book about it, you Right, a body can practice, and so if you're practicing to take a high stakes exam, it makes sense. Doing lots of questions make uh, will get you prepared. Um, many along the way would say things like lectures, doing review courses, uh, uh, even sort of gamification like Jeopardy and, and making competitions, which we'll talk a little bit about as we go through. Um, and then last, what resources have you found most useful? Again, the biggest uh, answer I got even here was questions and um, and doing specific things like whether it's your world questions or mix-up questions for your medicine boards, uh, flashcards to, to, to draw from memory, um, and, 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 and you see some of the other, other options there. So, so here's what I'd like to try to accomplish today. And I want to do this in an interactive way. Those of you online, I'm watching the chat, as you can tell, because I heard about the pixelated thing. And then in person, um, have your cell phones ready. We're going to have uh, ways for you to interact with the content. Um, and I want to be able to identify limitations of some of the traditional methods we encounter when we're teaching and learning in medicine. Um, I, I also want to touch on some of the challenges that you all have and hear from you about the challenges you have in ensuring competence in geriatrics and palliative medicine. 
uh, whether it's you and me in the residency space, the fellow space, and even in CME. And then I'll, we'll get a little bit into some interactive techniques to improve learning in some of those environments. I want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do to break out of the traditional mold of how we deliver a lot of our content in medical education, especially when it comes to uh, large groups of learners. And then, and then last, end with some, again, some R&D, some future innovations that we're uh, trying to uh, implement and, and test to, uh, to do some things different when it comes to teaching and learning uh, in medicine. So here's your first one. This is a QR code. You should be able to answer two questions when you do this. First one is about what generation you are. So you can tell us which, which uh, generation you hail from. And the second is what your role is. And one of them also says if you're a resident, we'll say resident slash fellow. If you're a fellow. Give you a second to grab that. So see some phones. I only know one question. You got one question. Once you answer it, it should move on to the next one. I think. Once been created an account, should I create an account? What's that? It wants you shouldn't have to create an account. I shouldn't have to create an account. But it's telling us to now. Huh. That's to sign up. Facebook. You shouldn't have to do that. Well, here's the thing. Um, do you have a code? Learned, what's that? Do you have a code? The code of the learning? Um, well, this is why when you're lecturing, this is the meta part of this, you have to be flexible. So <laughs> let's just do this old school. <laughs> Tell me your generation. Uh, I'm sure I don't see uh, silent generation folks. Any baby boomers? How about Gen Xers? Uh, millennials? Got some millennials in the chat. You guys can put it in the chat if you're online. And then Gen Z folks? Any Gen Z folks? Okay. Okay, so we're predominantly Gen X and millennials, but we've got some others. How about your current role? Students? Any students here? How about residents or fellows? Residents or fellows, faculty? I think most of you are faculty and other. I don't want to I should be more specific about other. It's not a, not a, not a bucket of uh, just other people. So other like administrators and the like. Oh, 1985, PG-Web 4. Right um, boy, I can remember 1985. Okay. <laughs> Let me talk about uh, some of the things that keep me up at night in my current role and as a, a faculty physician. I, I think the biggest one is that I, I realize how old I am, especially as a Gen Xer. Uh, and it's made me think a lot about how I was taught in medical school and how I teach and how we teach in general. But things have changed and evolved so quickly with technology. You think about what's happened with the pandemic and how that's really forced us to be flexible uh, and nimble in the way we deliver these things. I also want to, I also worry a lot about the ends goals. And when I say ends, ends goals like board certification, like MOC, like Longitudinal knowledge assessment, these types of things keep me up at night. And sometimes I wonder if it's really about the generational differences or if it's just about the fact that, we, that uh, as, as we as faculty get older and, and more seasoned, how much uh, flexibility and how much generational um, empathy do we have for the folks that are coming behind us. And um, what's different about adult learning today than it was in the past, as I mentioned, is, is now millennial learners are absolutely our faculty. We saw that Gen Z are our medical students and residents. And, and again, I think the end goals may well be evolving, which I'll talk about, but certainly the means to get there are also evolving. And when I did a PubMed search, so you look at millennial learners, there's only about just over 100 results in PubMed. Uh, and a lot of it is, is talking about some of the pedagogy around teaching folks in this generation. And as you see here, you have your millennials right there in the middle. There's me, the Gen Xer, uh, and so on. And there's another good article from Medical Teacher, which actually talks about tips for facilitating millennial learning. It's almost like a user's manual to your uh, medical students and faculty. And there's common themes here. Uh, the idea of, a, again, recognizing environmental and cultural forces that affect uh, millennial learners and beyond, um, certainly about uh, how to utilize current e-learning technologies and being nimble with that. These all make perfect sense. But I also thought this was really funny when I finally looked at it. This is actually 10 years old. This article is already uh, already ancient, but it comes to how fast things are moving. 
Uh, alas, um, I was encouraged by this article from a medical science teacher, which, which essentially talked about um, um, a little more optimistic view of where we're headed. That medicine is really just seeing the first cohort of millennials and the workforce as faculty um, and the influence of them and the generational characteristics of their success and challenges really hasn't been fully explored and what that's going to mean going forward in medical education. Um, but what we do know is that folks of this generation that are now our faculty, you all, many of you, uh, have more medical information at your fingertips. Uh, you're more current, you're more learner-centered, and more diverse, not just in terms of our demographics, but also in our thought processes. And I think that's really important. I think that's really encouraging. Um, a little bit about the end. So we think about things like board certification. There's a lot of literature on board certification. And it makes sense. It's been around for well over 100 years. It started with the ophthalmologists in 1917. It makes sense that they kind of started this whole thing uh, because at the time, as physicians were becoming a little more specialized in what they do in practice, they wanted to sort of define the boundaries of the content areas that define our specialties, whether it's the eye, uh, whether it's internal medicine versus pediatrics. The idea being, how do we self-regulate ourselves as a profession so that we might be able to hold ourselves accountable to the public for our competence and our safety. Um, and these days, there's, you, there's not only just the eye, but there's all kinds of chambers. You can specialize in chambers of the eye. You know, who knows what's coming next? <laughs> um, and I think this, was, uh, this is something that also has led to a lot of discussion. Uh, about how... Uh, uh, to achieve the vision of continuing board certification, especially when you think about if you ever picked up Newsweek or the New York Times or any article in the last 10 years where there was a lot of vitriol towards uh, 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 board certification, especially maintenance and certification tends to be, uh, tend to be a real driver there. So from that, uh, this group came up with, with uh, some guidelines. And I think it's really important to think about this um, as, as you decide what you're going to do as you go on in your career as well. Um, lifelong learning has to be also uh, um, accountable for professionalism in the assessments that we do. And we have to have alternatives to point in time tests. Is it really, um, is it really uh, forward thinking to just have a 10 year exam every single time we recertify without a lot of accountability other than the CMEs we submit in the, in the interim? Um, how do you communicate fairness and transparency in the system? How do you make sure that we're not punishing subspecialties when it comes to trying to keep these things up over time. Because 30 years ago, it didn't even exist that you had to be certified. You got your initial cert and you were done. You were just left to your own devices and hopefully everything went just fine. Um, that's changed. And I think really important, and this is something that I um, am passionate about, is that we have to be doing more research to show at least non-inferiority between the kinds of things we're doing for continuing certification uh, and the value to the public and to our patients. Um, so. Uh, I think this is also really interesting if you've been reading uh, um, some of the medical periodicals over the past few months. The American College of, College of Cardiology has mm -hmm. actually come out and decided that their primary specialty of cardiology, as well as all other subspecialties, are going to start developing their own uh, both initial certification and maintenance certification uh, uh, exams. And this is a real shot across the bow um, for ABIM. Mm -hmm. And who's going to follow? Uh, or maybe this won't be successful at all. I think it remains to be seen. But they certainly have the uh, machinery to do this because they already administer an initial certification exam for, uh, uh, for the international market, which is really, really interesting. Um, Grant McMahon from the ACC and the Warren Newton, I think, spelled out really important key areas to address with this. And, and again, how do we establish regional competency expectations? Many of us don't practice the same kind of medicine, even if we're geriatricians. Some of us are practicing in areas that are very profoundly underserved. Some of us are practicing in areas that don't speak English as a first language, for example. Um, the, 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 there's the hospitalists and, and the ambulists and the sniffists, and it doesn't matter to have an assessment that truly reflects my practice patterns? Or do I have to keep taking the same one-size-fits-all assessment to show that I'm competent to practice? You know, the one thing that might argue against as you think about the pandemic, and I've heard this argument also in, this, in a significant minority of people that says, well, think about what happened during the pandemic when it was all hands-on then. 
We had dermatologists working in the ICU. You know, we had rheumatologists working on floors taking care of COVID patients. So isn't it important that we expect all of us to obtain a certain level of competence if we're going to be pulled into situations such as a pandemic to take care of people that need us? I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Um, because that certainly did come up. And this certainly happens in the military where the majority of healthcare professionals in military service are cross-trained to do various types of tasks in, uh, in crisis situations, regardless of what your role or rank. Um, so two sides of the coin here. I want you to think about that. I would love to hear your thoughts as we go through. Now, if you do a search for maintenance and certification, there's about 1,500 results of that. I, I pulled some of the titles because they're actually quite crazy. Uh, uh, but these are actual titles of articles. A work in progress. Uh, demystifying. The social contract. Is it working? <laughs> we all agree that no one likes MOC. That's the title of it. Um, so, yeah, you know, whether it's popular press or in PubMed, there's a lot of vitriol towards this process. And we can talk about the why or why nots of those as we go through, too. And then certainly for certification or recertification prep, you know, there's about 300 or so results in PubMed. Majority of the things that you would imagine, board prep and lectures and courses, a lot of it is sort of rooted in sort of satisfaction or self-efficacy ratings, um, self-assessment questions, and then, of course, the traditional enduring materials. But what do you use? What do you learn best? I think we talked about this in our earlier groups, um, and, and a lot of the answers were questions, questions, questions. And just a little bit to talk about geriatrics and palliative medicine as well, competencies uh, across the across the continuum. I'm, one thing I'm, I'm interested also in getting your input in is priority areas for training. Um, who's the target of these trainings? Um, if they're not within our own specialty, but say we're training uh, other primary care providers. And where are the companies that have synergy across our practices? Uh, whether it's in geriatrics and internal medicine, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of our own data. Um, just to give you some context, the American College of Physicians is the largest specialty uh, society in North America. We have about 162,000 members, which is about a third of all internal medicine practitioners in the U.S. and its territories. So, so it's a pretty good sampling, uh, and I think you'll be interested to see some of the membership uh, needs data that was expressed most recently. So let's take two minutes. I want you to talk to each other for a second. What are the challenges in ensuring competence in these areas across the continuum in your learners? What are you faced with? And then I want to hear some thoughts. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm trying to work on this right now, but internal medicine residents, they still have no idea what a SNP is like. They need to go to the I'm, I'm going to paraphrase with the online folks. Internal medicine residents have no idea what a SNP is. It's not going to either. Huh? It's tending to. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but they don't learn, right? So they need to do an elective or something. Right? Yeah, I, I was telling, yeah, I was telling some faculty earlier when I was in St. Louis, um, we did a GME uh, orientation program where we actually created a, uh, a nursing home scavenger hunt for the new interns. <laughs> so we made them go find a nurse. Go, <laughs> find, go find wall oxygen. Go find a, go find a, a BiPAP machine. Uh, those kind of things mm -hmm. that they may or may not take for granted as actually be able to do in a place like that. When they send patients out, and it was pretty, uh, pretty eye opening. Maybe so, they're working on changing. That's not what they wanted to. Working on changing. Yeah. <laughs> How about uh, at least another one? Any other other thoughts, Eric? Yes. We talk about competing demands for faculty. Like, it, you're so much focused on RVUs that you don't have time teaching. So, if you want to do geriatric health medicine, competence of learners, who's going to do it? If yeah. everybody's focused on the whole revenue. Right. right. You got, if you have to keep your RVU machine rolling, how can you focus on ensuring competence uh, across the continuum of your learners? And ensuring is a really operative word there, isn't it? Because in many ways, we're saying assessment. Are you assessing their competence, even if it's in a formal, informal way at the bedside? Good. Any others? Nothing online. So, great. Thank you. And so the, the year that I started medical school was the year that the Institute of Medicine Committee uh, created this uh, Training Physicians to Care for Older Americans report. Many of you may remember this. Um, I guess I'd be interested to see if you, if you think that this has significantly changed the landscape in the last 20 plus years. Has it actually gotten better? Especially thinking about the challenges we have. Um, in 2014, I had the opportunity to uh, 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 work on a paper with, with your own Anna Chang and some other geriatric leaders looking at GME uh, um, complexities and trying to come up with an education agenda for internal medicine and geriatric medicine. And um, there were three priority areas that came out of this. Um, and it was a lot of us also citing some of that initial 20 years prior to the medicine report. Um, and three things came out team based care. How, how are folks operating in interdisciplinary teams and even cross disciplinary teams? Transitions and readmissions, which makes sense, and then multi morbidity. And, and certainly, uh, knowing that medicine residents, as, as many of you have alluded to, they're caring for complex cases in an increasingly complex system that they're working in, um, that there needs to be more emphasis on some of these competencies, especially when they're transitioning out of the hospital to uh, another setting. Uh, attention to multimorbidity that's affects some things like prognosis and certainly team-based care. Um, and that this should also have a program evaluation and a program of improvement, uh, trying to improve uh, the outcomes in GME and ultimately our patients. Um, palliative medicine, something similar with uh, work that um, our friends Chris Schaefer, uh, Laura Morrison, and others have done to look at generalist level palliative care competencies. Um, Fair amount of overlap with some of the ones in geriatrics, but obviously uh, some others that are sort of independent of that related to pain and symptom management, um, psychosocial, spiritual aspects of care, and so on. And how do you uh, how do we hold generalist level uh, trainees uh, uh, accountable for these competencies as well? Bless you. Um, one thing you can also grab this if you'd like. This is a really interesting article that came out from the Alliance of Academic Internal Medicine, where they got their own residency. And, and undergrad program directors together um, and course directors to talk about um, team, um, sorry, uh, UME to GME transition and how we improve 
that handover of the student to becoming the intern, right? So I remember as a recovery program director myself, some of those, you know, sometimes looking at some of the applications for residency was like reading real estate ads, right? So you never knew exactly what you were getting with some uh, of your new interns. We'll do really well with mentoring. You know, very assertive on that, so you know what that means. Right? So <laughs> try to read between the lines. The bottom line being, is there a way to create a system by which we can ensure that you and me to GME transition gets to the things that keep them most safe when they finally get that graduated level of uh, independence in the hospital? And so in this case, if you look at uh, some of the capstone topics as well as the GME orientation topics that's, that uh, these folks were recommending, there's some synergies here with what we are espousing as being important in palliative care and in geriatrics. So end of life discussions rated highly as something that uh, students in a capstone course in medical school should be trained on how to do. Interprofessional education rated very highly. For, for the residents, when they come to, the, to, the, to their residency program, uh, in, interpersonal communication skills within the team was rated as medium and with other nurses and professionals. And one thing that was common across both the UME and the GME space as being incredibly highly important was how do you effectively transition care or do handovers? Makes sense. So these are things that are obviously very much um, in line with, with what we were saying in geriatrics and even palliative medicine. The question is how you get there because we haven't quite figured out how to do this in a, in a uniform way uh, across sites because it's resource intensive. And just to give you an idea also what's happening with us at ACP, this is, this is, this is a needs assessment that we did uh, over the past two years for folks that did any CME activity in internal medicine through ACP and things that they wanted or things they searched for. And in the top, um, and, and this, this is a, a probably could be five slides long when you look at what's listed here, but geriatrics and things like osteoporosis are rated as things that members need to learn more about. These are top, and we're talking general internal medicine physicians, the majority of which aren't academic physicians. These are folks that are working out in practice, in private practice many times, or in group practice settings or hospital-based settings. And, and just a close second, uh, it's certainly in the top half of needs was end of life and palliative care. Now, when you look at what we're able to offer, at least in, in the work that we do, um, on this access you see here, this is requested topics from member surveys, uh, whether it's from meetings or from CME uh, types of activities, and the low to high content availability is on the left side axis, and then the low to high member demand is on the, on the bottom axis. And the purple dots here rep represent um, um, activities that are actually state CME requirements for these folks, okay? So right here in this area are things like delirium dementia, end of life and palliative care, osteoporosis, and the care of complex cases. This is what we do. And this is what general internal medicine physicians want and actually don't necessarily have a lot of access to. So there is a need here, is what I'm saying. And we've known this need existed for the last 25 years. And I can I compel you to try to help fill these gaps because we need help. Um, here, actually, is geriatrics specifically. A big swath of people were asking for geriatrics content. And in many states, there are state based CME requirements for uh, specific types of geriatric competencies. So, going back to the uh, recommendations and thinking again about the GME space, um, this is the challenge, and this is what, what you were saying earlier. If we're going to do this, we need time to do it. And if we need time to do it, then we probably need money to do it. Um, and, and certainly these faculty that came up with these guidelines concede that you need a broad bench of facilitators to be able to do this, and it's very resource intensive. Um, but certainly depends on the on potential delivery methods. And certainly if you're going to do things like simulations or other types of things, high upfront resource uh, intensity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, versus didactic types of things. And if you look, you know, a, a lot of the delivery formats that were recommended, at least as one of the options, half of the topics in the UME capstone topics were saying you should, you could give it as a lecture or a didactic. And the didactic could be anything from a large group lecture to a small group teaching session to a bedside session, right? The UME capstone topics, I'm sorry, the, the GME orientation topics, 100% of them said, well, we could probably figure a way to do this in a didactic way for all of these things. So this is why I want to talk a little bit about interactive techniques to improve learning. In various ways. Where are we going? Where have we been when it comes to doing things like lectures and didactics? Um, and, and a little bit about the history of continuous professional development. So, so this is a, 
the anatomy lesson, we're going to do a little bit of history lesson. I'm hoping not to induce any postprandial ptosis here. Uh, I'm not going to go into paintings all afternoon. But uh, it's interesting to me that this is not a new topic, that, and this is not a new uh, uh, idea, is to put the patient at the center of the teaching of medicine. <laughs> right, and whether that patient is a cadaver or the patient is at the bedside, in this case, uh, you know, at a teaching hospital with the residents uh, standing around uh, and interviewing a patient, an expert faculty member interviewing the patient. Certainly, we know William Osler, this is him at Pennsylvania Hospital uh, teaching medicine uh, at the cadaver table, and then. Uh, Edward Janeway, who was a famous New York City physician and one of America's premier internal medicine doctors in the late 19th century, doing, doing the theater talk, where he's interviewing a patient uh, at the, in the chair, and all the medical students and the residents in their suits are diligently taking notes and paying attention, right, to where we are now, which is PowerPoint. <laughs> And I, I, my personal opinion is that in many ways we, we have a tendency to have devolved into PowerPoint. Um, and, and, and in many cases, you could argue we've taken the patients out of the classroom. Um, so a little bit more about that. Uh, but the challenge here, again, is exactly everything that you said. we got to have the time and we have to have the resources and the faculty development in many cases, especially for our newer faculty, to deal with things like organizational issues, um, how to deliver quality lectures that actually make behavioral change in our partners. Um, and certainly something we're faced with as geriatricians or palliative care physicians is that if we're dealing with different levels of learners or even different specialties, like generalists, we have to be making it clinically relevant to the people that are taking care of these patients. Don't just give me a slide set when I could just read in a book. Maybe have to read that ahead of time, but come with the idea that you can actually use practical points, use, use the latest, latest science, and actually have case examples and bring the patient back into the teaching. Um, everything was also you know, thrown into disarray, as you know, when we had to go online in the pandemic, and certainly a whole different and overlapping skill set to do this kind of teaching and this kind of learning in an interactive way online. And so, uh, it's, it's interesting because if you look in the literature, there's actually uh, a smattering of things coming out now talking about the efficacy of lectures in the pandemic area. And, and none of these things will probably surprise you. Attendance improved. You know, if I can actually log in in my jammies and go to Grand House <laughs> and still get CMA, I might do that. Right? So that's been a thing. Attendance has improved. Uh, not surprising in that paper. Uh, you get a diverse audience, and it seems that the ratings were not inferior for, for, as opposed to doing them in person when they compared them. But the barriers are obviously things like being able to run a, a Zoom chat at the same time as actually delivering a talk. The time to do that, and the resources, and the tech resources, and the infrastructure to do that. And certainly, you have to be willing to teach in that, in that, uh, in that mode. And many people aren't necessarily very... Um, very skilled at it or very willing uh, to learn that. But also keep in mind, and I stole this from, a, uh, from an agriculture science education class, some of the greatest teachers we've had of all time were actually online. They were taught, taught virtually, right? So you, those of us that are generation X or older, we recognize these people. <laughs> So one thing I'm also not going to uh, belabor, but I think is a really good resource if you wanted to snatch this, is a guide from medical teacher that talks about remote learning uh, and, and GME education in response to the pandemic. This is a distillation of a lot of really, really important literature on teaching remotely. And you can actually go to table two of this article and actually there's a really nice set of guidelines to actually uh, improve uh, teaching in the virtual setting. Again, some of these things are probably relatively straightforward. Optimizing group size so you can actually have good engagements. Uh, uh, leveraging social media advertising to reach diverse participants. Uh, technical concerns, connectivity. And the things that were very unique to us in medicine um, that we have to think about even more so when we're online is privacy. Uh, if we're talking about sensitive information, patient information, we have to be very mindful when we're teaching in a setting like this. Uh, where we know there's 50 people online, we don't necessarily know every number that's on there. So, so this is that uh, table, um, and again, a QR code if you want to grab them. <laughs> so <laughs> let's read this together. <laughs> so as we're doing this, let's, let's stop for a second and do another 
under uh, quiz. So how long do we concentrate in, in on average during a 60-minute lecture? If you're online, you can put your answer in the chat. <laughs> so who says five minutes? Who says 15 minutes? Who says 30 minutes? Wow, you are really... Who says the whole time? I can sit and concentrate for 60 minutes. <laughs> I know 90% of you have been looking at your phone at least three times during this. <laughs> and that's really important because I think, I'm sure many of you have heard the 15 minute thing about the 60 minute lecture. This has been perpetuated actually since 1978. And this was a journal, uh, this was a Lancet article that actually studied this in college students. Um, but think about what's happened since 1978. 1978, we didn't have iPhones. Um, <laughs> really didn't even have the internet. Uh, all the things that have made us uh, a little bit less attentive to lectures didn't exist back then. What's funny is that there's been studies since that have actually uh, called out this uh, study as being flawed and being perpetuated over time. That in, in general, the Journal of Physiology did a nice little article on this, that the most consistent finding in attention in lectures had less to do uh, with what you're doing uh, um, with the activities, but it's really the efficacy of the teacher and not really the format. Uh, Microsoft also did a TED talk about this and said, well, actually our average attention span is actually only eight seconds. Right. So that's really, uh, uh, considering the fact that Goldfish average attention span is nine seconds. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> and that's according to Ted Lasso. <laughs> so really, it's important to vary these activities very much. Got to renew attention. You need to generate interest. And obviously, giving feedback, obtaining feedback. Again, trying to demonstrate some of these things during this lecture as well, because these are the kind of things we're trying to teach our faculty and our courses and the like to be able to do, uh, to kind of break out of the molds that we sort of, again, divulge into. Um, things like audience response systems, if you can get them to work, <laughs> like me, um, there's been some studies on this actually, and you can improve knowledge scores and actually get learner reaction to that. I thought it was really interesting that uh, for GME space, audience response systems can be useful in the sleep deprived. So really, they're the rumble strips of a lecture for, uh, for, uh, for residents that are sleep deprived, especially for post Um Interesting finding. So, using these buzz groups, showing a video clip, demonstrating a task, and then students want questions. What are the things that I actually really enjoy doing? And not in a sadistic way, but to put up a multiple choice question for students that actually has maybe two right answers. Because you want them to struggle, you want them to wrestle with the material, and it's okay in a low stage setting to get them to pick that up, um, as an example. So whether it's a flipped classroom, all of these things take a lot of upfront effort, right? And again, we talked about the fact that effort and time are at the premium these days. But there are ways to make these more interactive, more high yield, and even more brief. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as I go through as well. But so much of it requires informal feedback. We know newer generations of learners are used to getting constant feedback in minimal ways and even more instructive ways. And we need to be attentive to that using things like polling and social media as well. So, just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean it's not. <laughs> it might be a little harsh, but the idea is uh, it's there. So, let me uh, switch a little bit to what the future holds in terms of board prep. Again, the things that keep me slipped uh, up at night related to initial search, MOC, and even LKA. And I'd be interested to know what people are doing. Um, what are you going to be doing in your future? Are you going to be doing, who's going to be doing or has been doing the 10 year exam? <laughs> How about anybody in LKA? Yeah, I'm in LKA. I'm, I'm going to do Jerry and internal medicine. So who's not doing either of those things? Forget it, I'm not doing any of them. Okay. Good, okay. And I've uh, got some folks online who are going to do LKA. Yeah, you know what? We, we can talk about LKA. Um, What's interesting, if you look at ABIM's data, um, and this is actually, this data is now almost, it's well over a year old. These numbers have gone up. 80% of folks uh, are actually choosing LKA or the traditional assessment. So uh, and, and a smaller proportion of people as they're approaching their 10-year deadline are actually choosing the 10-year exam or rolling it out which is an interesting phenomenon. I don't know whether it's good or bad. It goes back to the idea that the burden of, uh, of evidence is still there 
as to whether LKA is equivocal to a 10 year exam, whatever that might actually mean in terms of patient outcomes and patient safety and competence. Uh, because in many ways, I feel like they've been building the plane as they started flying. So we'll see. Um, so I want to um, wrap up here with a couple of discussions about some future innovations. What does the future hold for some of these uh, uh, ways of delivering content? We'll talk about microlearning, some simulation related things. I want to talk about AI. Uh, if that perks anybody's interest, and then gamification. So, so microlearning is something um, that has become more and more prevalent in the non-healthcare, non-medical uh, realm when it comes to creating credentials or badges for certain things. And this is breaking content into these smaller focus tasks uh, to manage cognitive load. And they're meant to be short. They don't even have to be virtual, but the ideas are horrible. So typically they are pushed out uh, to a smartphone. They're done on demand. And they're one objective, one solitary objection, objective. And they are typically, obviously, digital. Uh, and there's not a lot of published literature on microlearning and medical education yet, but I think it's coming. Even in PubMed right now, there's less than 50 citations. Um, but, but I think the challenge is this is a great way to get information out to people to spark interest with the hope that they'll dig deeper into certain topics. Um, if you're familiar with the Swiss cheese model of learning, that if you're only learning around the fringes of certain things you think you need to know, there's going to be Swiss cheese holes that line up and a patient will fall through them. So it's not enough to teach a wide range of information in the field of med ed, but only micro learning it has to be part of a blended technique or blended uh, strategy. That's the caveat to this. Um, if you want, you can go to this code and you can see a demo of, of micro learning that we've done for some of our point of care ultrasound courses. Um, and I will see if I can also demo it here. If you, well, you're grabbing it, so you can grab it. You can take a look at it on your on your own time, so I don't have to stop the show. Um, but this is an example of, of things you might push out to learners. This can be done on the train, on the trolley, on the, on the, on the streetcar. Um, and it's meant to be portable. And it's, some, it's the kind of thing that uh, hopefully sparks further learning. And when it comes to simulation, this has been such a big thing in medical schools for the past 25, 30 years. Uh, and, and we have to ask fundamental questions if you're going to use simulation about how it's going to help evolve learning and even assessment to better approximate real world practice. What is it replacing and what efficiencies are you gaining by doing that? Because simulations in themselves, it doesn't matter if it's a heart, a heart sound simulator or whatever you want it to be, it's got to be learner centered. It's got to be able to get to competencies that you can't otherwise do in an efficient way with a lot of learners over time and things that may well be difficult uh, to teach or assess in other types of settings. So, so getting, letting students, letting residents crash the plane in the simulator uh, as opposed to on the runway is the whole idea behind them. But again, resource intensive, whether it be time and whether it be money. Uh, and certainly you still have, you can't just have fancy bells and whistles simulators without actually having trained facilitators that are delivering and expecting the objectives of the, uh, of the activity with the simulation. And for things like procedural skills, it may only be good at the beginning of, of the learning curve. So I think that's a real challenge with, with simulation in general. So let me talk a little bit about AI. And this one makes me really nervous because I feel like I don't know a lot about AI, but we are starting to delve into this a little bit. And there's probably many of you out there that know a lot more about this. And this is starting to come up, not just in what we want to do in teaching and learning, but obviously in practice um, with so much uh, health information that we have access to. How is it going to help us reduce costs? Can we use it to produce after-visit summaries? We were talking at lunch about uh, creating the template for my recommendation letters for certain you know, types of students, let's say. Um, and, and certainly it's come up uh, whether or not it's a risk to patient health information if you're using an open AI system and, and putting that kind of information in. There's also things related to um, copyright. So um, uh, ACP in general has not come out with a real policy per se about how to use and be cautious about AI, but Annals of Internal Medicine, the, uh, the journal, um, has come out with a policy related to artificial intelligence that folks have to attest uh, if they're submitting a manuscript, which has actually already happened for Annals, someone submitted a manuscript that utilized artificial intelligence, and, and that, that artificial intelligence it actually says this in the policy. Artificial intelligence should not be listed as authors because they cannot be responsible for the accuracy, integrity, or originality of the work. 
uh, talking about AI as a person, as an author, but it's already happened. So um, they had to very quickly come up with policy related to this. Um, this um, this uh, research letter that was submitted related to clinical decision making in cardiology is an example of, of some of the things that we've come up against with copyright because the, those questions are actually copyright and you need permission to use them. But somebody was able to just dump them into an AI, open AI system and actually uh, get a, a letter published related to that. And that's a, that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> and it's one that's probably going to only grow as the technology becomes more available and people are more uh, nimble with it. So certainly some of the challenges we have is obviously is, is the authoring and creation, the intellectual property issues, as I said. Um, and there's certainly folks that are unintentionally infringing and they're not even knowing it, like, I've been pasting mix that into AI, and then it's just out there. Um, and the obfus obfuscation of content. So I can throw a bunch of content into AI, and then it comes back to me in sort of a, it looks sort of the same, but it's not. It's like, you know, vanilla ISIS cover of the Queen song, and you can tell it's the same thing, but it's not, right? So, sorry, that was definitely Gen X. <laughs> um, so, so this is really challenging, and I think we're able to think about it in med medical education in terms of creating efficiencies in the things we may be able to do. Whether it's creating, we, we've been able to create images of tables. Uh, we can actually create photos of folks that we want. You know, we want a, uh, a a male patient that has this BMI and this uh, skin tone um, smiling, and it will create a, a person that never existed for a photo, and we don't have to get the for example. Um, we've been able to create scripts for video-based summaries of content. So in some of our board review products, we've able, I've been able to narrate one chapter of a, of, a, of a board review text, let's say, put it into something called Lemon Labs, which is a, a voice cloning system. And it'll clone my voice and then do the rest of the transcription of the entire book, 600, 6,000 pages, whatever it is. That's not perfect. Um, because things like you know, medical terms is one thing that AI has not quite figured out, especially when it comes to pronouncing them. Like instead of uh, gastroesophageal, they'll say gastroesophageal reflux disease as jerd. <laughs> Subtleties. And so, so I think the lesson learned for us with AI is that it should create efficiencies, but it doesn't exonerate us from having very careful uh, human uh, oversight of the content because it's not going to always be perfect. Um, two other things I'll mention related to AI. One is this obesity management lifestyle modification. We're currently updating the content for our obesity module in lifestyle modification. We're going to be utilizing a, um, a uh, AI, open AI, um, close, it's actually a closed AI system to create a module where you can practice doing counseling of a patient and the, the, the AI bots, for lack of a better term, will actually give you feedback on how well you're doing that compared to experts as a means of teaching people how to do counseling. Um, an article just came out in Forbes in the last week. I encourage you to look it up. It's about AI and teaching empathy to medical students. There are schools that are actually trying to utilize AI to do this, and it's actually surprisingly doing relatively well. <laughs> Uh, the last thing is I mentioned this NYU uh, Langone study. Uh, Jesse Rafael at NYU is actually engaging with us to do a study. And again, this goes back to the idea of, you know, can we match each one of your professional practices to the assessments you should be getting to determine your competence? And what they want to do is, is look at ICD-10 codes in an EHR system of a given person, of a given resident, of a given faculty member, and be able to do um, just-in-time uh, assessments and prescriptions for learning based on practice patterns. So if, if my system sees that you are maybe not doing the standard of care for foot checks and diabetes or A1Cs, whatever it is, it will flag it and it'll be able to send, send you an assessment related to that and then also point you to resources to learn more about it. So, and this is all utilizing a, a closed AI system, which I think is really cool. So hopefully that comes to, comes to pass. And then I'll mention just briefly about gamification and the last time we have. And this is application of game design elements using scorecards, badges. The one thing that we've learned is that residents and fellows are competitive people. Well, physicians are competitive people. <laughs> and there's something to giving folks mixed-set questions. But there's another level of doing questions and actually creating a leaderboard 
creating teams for these things. Um, James, James Willig, who's at UAB, is, a, is an internal medicine physician who has actually created an open access gamification platform called Kaizen. And he's used it for not just physicians, but other professions to create gamification for improving education. And you can go on the site and actually see examples of this. This is one where um, he created a site for infectious disease fellows to actually have a contest um, uh, related to um, infectious disease IDSA um, prep materials. So they would do 10 questions at a time. You would get feedback just like this. And then you see there would be this national leaderboard various teams and things. And what they found in that is that you had you had ongoing engagement of folks in the actual question and the learning, people keeping up with milestones related to what they were expected to read and learn, and continuous improvement. Um, and, and, by, and so there's a lot to be studied here yet, but it seems like because, it, because we're dealing with how do we save time, how do we do it portably, and be able to keep people engaged, things like AI, microlearning, gamification may be uh, uh, really important tools going forward. So I'm going to stop there, and hopefully I've achieved these four objectives that I set out for you. I appreciate your time, and I hope to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. We actually uh, would like to give you this plaque. It says a teacher of X attorney. And just as appreciation for you being one of our visiting professors. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thinking about questions. And there are so many interesting research questions to ask about effective learning tools. What's the funding mechanisms for doing <laughs> these types of, of studies? So the question is, what's the funding mechanism for doing these types of studies? I would say. Uh, the, the typical funding is called an unfunded mandate. <laughs> um, there have been instances where we try to do some of this stuff and, and actually had to go with unrestricted grants from industry. Uh, I think we, you know, and being able to do that can put us at odds with our ACCMA accreditation. So we have to be very careful in, uh, when we're doing that. But, but in many cases, there's just not a lot of funding for education. You know, uh, gone are the days of the Hartfords and the Reynolds grants and these other things that were so pivotal in getting some of this stuff, getting lots of my career, GACAs, things like that, um, uh, just few and far between. And so I don't know where we're headed in terms of trying to lower our guard, do a thoughtful reevaluation of how the folks with the, the deep pocket can actually help us do better education. And in many cases, we've gone to folks like you know, Nordisk, you know, for diabetes things, have it for continuous glucose monitoring and saying, you know, if, you, if we can get an unrestricted grant where we don't have to actually do anything very specific to your products and things like that, then we won't be in arrears with, with our accreditation. These are very difficult lines to, um, to draw. I'm looking online. I just want to make sure I, I answer anything that's come up here. Um, the extent to which med ed should tackle instruction in broader areas in clinical biological science, such as sociology, politics of medicine, um, driving healthcare outcomes, structural factors like racism or poverty, potentially how to advocate. Ooh, I just lost these questions. I'm sorry, go ahead and answer. <laughs> um, so I think, goodness. Uh, how to advocate or organize to improve these conditions. Curious and thoughts on the pulse of where this is going. Then, um, and this is from Matthew. Um, yeah, I think um, more, when I worked at NBME, this was the type of place where uh, uh, test blueprints were made of organ systems. And only in the past 10 years have they started thinking about social determinants of health and uh, professionalism and, and competencies like structural factors. Uh, rethinking how we're portraying patients and even their family members. Um, uh, we have a long way to go still. Uh, the challenge is, um, and I hate this term, the soft competencies, but because they're, they're not soft, they're hard, and they are hard and they're difficult hard. Um, we need better ways to do this. And I, I was talking about this with someone earlier that, you know, the one thing that I think is most important is we have to think about other ways to assess what's important other than medical knowledge, because we're really good at doing that. But what about these other things that are important? I'm with you on this, and I think we're looking for, for ideas in that, in that sense, for sure. Um, 
There's one open question. Uh, when you asked about wish lists for med students, understanding of geriatrics, I was thinking how I want them and us to understand more how forces like private equity shape nursing home and hospice care. It's mm-hmm. a great point, man. That's also for Matthew. So, yeah, thank you for that. Any other questions or thoughts? I I, uh, I want to invite you to please engage with me. Um, I'm, as you saw in the job that I do, I am a Trojan horse for geriatrics and palliative care. <laughs> <laughs> Very large organization. I think, as you saw, it's not just me that thinks this is important, but there's a lot of folks out there that are yearning for us to uh, answer the call from that original IOM paper from 25 years ago. So, so looking forward to working with you. Thank you.